Hey, good morning, everyone. Today is June 3rd, 2017, and this is the John Chappelle Natural, Natural Philosophy Society Morning Science Chat. And uh, today we have uh, with us David Hilster, and we have our uh, upcoming uh, conference in British Columbia coming up very soon. So let's hear. So uh, I'll let David take it away then. All right. Sorry, I got to get my everything on there. Um, yeah, I'm gonna. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show some uh, slides here. I made a slide presentation just in case I couldn't make it, but I found a politically expedient and correct way to get here. <laughs> so I'm actually at a different location here. Um, I can't share something, but maybe you can do that. Um, uh, Movie or the PowerPoint? Franklin, the slides. The slides. Okay, let's do the slides. There we go. All right, those should be loading. I'll let them load, and then that way I won't be talking. My tendency is to talk about things before they come up, so I'm going to try to. Hey, there we go. The C CNPS 2017. Um, we are going to be doing it in Vancouver, one of the places I've always wanted to do it. One of the reasons um, I suggested doing it there was so that we could be a little bit more international. Um, one of the other places we were thinking about eventually doing it would be in St. Petersburg because there are numerous Russians there and they, were, they would be very happy to help host that. So um, anyways, it's a very beautiful university. So if you can make it, it's on the West Coast as well. And um, uh, who lives there actually is Duncan Shaw. So we do have a person who is sort of local and he'll have something at his house actually. I think you're going to have to do the slides unless you can give me control or something, because I see no control over them. Well, I should be able to give you control. Let me see if I can do that. Okay, no problem. Let's see. So, Where is the thing that gives control? Yeah. All right. Somebody's heavy breathing. Wonderful. Let's see here more. There's some way I can give you... I think I have to promote you. That's it. Okay. Yeah, I think you do. Yeah. Okay. Now you should have control. I think. Yeah. There we go. Okay. I'm going to kick Franklin off here. All right. No. Just kidding. <laughs> Give me control. All right. Uh, but anyways, let's go to the next slide. This is our poster cut in half, basically. At the top here, you can see where the university is. It's actually at that location that you see there. So it's quite beautiful. Um, this year. Uh, we have a special guest coming in exclusively to this event. In fact, um, his, his um, airfare and hotel and everything is being paid by one of our directors, a uh, generous donation to get him all the way from Australia. He says he usually doesn't go anywhere without his wife, which usually is a signal you got to bring his wife. And that would have been just outrageous because Australia is not the cheapest place. Also, it's on the West Coast, so it's going to be cheaper than trying to get him to the East Coast. But I've been trying many, many years to get him. So anybody who's going to that is going to have a really big treat because, in my opinion, and many of us who subscribe to Expansion Tectonics, this is the most famous geologist of our time. And, um, again, if you don't know about him, he, he was um, the successor to Samuel Warren Carey, who was actually a plate tectonics person. But turned into an expansion tectonics person. But but Samuel Warren Carey is still very much uh, um, revered in the plate tectonics world, even though they sort of tolerated his, what they call dabbling in the in the uh, expansion tectonics. So that that's going to be just amazing. I think what's the most amazing part is how much geology has, but even more amazing than that is how he has come up. And this is one of the things I'm dying to discuss more with him is how he came up in geology with the idea that not only was the radius of the earth increasing, but the mass has been increasing. And he came to me seven or eight years ago. I probably told the story. I apologize, but it's worth repeating that he was begging for us to come up with some mechanisms. And some of us have some mechanisms. And there are actually some people looking at the mechanisms that it's coming from the sun going into the poles. Um, we think it's mostly in the South Pole. But regardless, it's amazing because how can you have a geologist who actually 
takes and comes to us and say, I, I have geological evidence of mass increase. That's pretty amazing. So he's going to be here. And um, I think that's that's going to be well worth having uh, us uh, coming to the, the conference just to see and be with him and be able to talk with him. That's going to be great. So uh, let's go to our next slide here. This is really, 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 really important. In fact, I sent this out to all the people who are attending. We're coming up to about 20 people attending. I know that doesn't sound like a lot, but it's it's a quite a good attendance for this longer uh, uh, distance of a place. And uh, the problem is with uh, this university, they require me to get a block of rooms and then I can only diminish that by 20% and then we'll be responsible even if we don't fill them, it's a mess. But every, every conference has their challenge, and that's what this one is. But I will tell you, the rooms are beautiful. They're $57 a night for these nice dorms. This is just one of the common areas for people to a dorm, and they have common areas, a kitchen area. It's really brand new system. Um, it says 69 Canadian dollars, but it's 57 for uh, a night or uh, so, uh, $110 for like a private hotel roomish kind of thing there. But you want to do this. If you are going, do it now. You have until June 19th or you will pay through the nose. Vancouver is pretty expensive downtown. So you're going to be not paying probably less than 200 a night. Of course, don't want to do that. So um, we really are looking forward to, to the people and, and staying in this place because it's very beautiful. So you need that in by the 19th. There is a link on our website. So if you go to the website, you will absolutely find it. Go to the, the first thing I talk about and you click on it. You use their private system to get in there. So they you use the UBC's website for um, registering your hotel room and you pay it through them, not through us, which is really great actually because it's a pain. Um, the proceedings are going along really well. I think we have at least 16 authors this year. We're in a bunch of papers. We're well over 200 page, pages. So very happy with that. We've got some new people in there. I'll talk about where some of them are coming from. Um, but it does use the shared latex online, which is, is great. Uh, the good thing is I now have a converter I've made uh, out of a computer language that um, a friend and I, and I wrote called NLP++ for natural language, but it will... Tra uh, once you have any paper that's in share latex, we'll be able to translate it and put it into the, our wiki, our natural philosophy, wiki.naturalphilosophy.org, which is coming quite along quite well as well. Um, we also have a lot of video help with this. We have people help. My father's actually doing some. Some people will pay uh, people to do it per page. It is $15 a page, but if you do do a lot of pages, we, off we absolutely give a discount for a person putting in 30, you know, 20, 10, 20, 30, 40 pages, which some people will do. Actually, we have one person um, looking to do a monograph. We don't know, I don't think it'll be done this year, but a monograph is when a, one of the members publishes an entire book with us and uh, someone is looking to do that this year. So anyways, that's going along swimmingly well. The system is great. It allows for us to go all the way to June 30th. Come on, look at the way it the world works now. June 30th is when you can be the last day of your, your um, abstract. We will have books at the conference 19 days later, probably actually sooner than that. And the system for shared latex isn't done in such a way that making the book itself is a matter of just moving the files, which is a pain, but moving them over into a common area and then running a program where I wrote I wrote some latex program, program to make a book out of it. Man, latex, I, I, I know a lot of computer languages and that's not one that I understand halfway. It's really, really primitive. But um, anyways, that's going along real well. Um, another thing that I want to talk to about is something that's working really well now is social media. Now everybody goes, yeah, it doesn't work because people aren't reading my right. Uh, well, it is working. And I have actually um, been working with this a couple of years to see which directions work best. And what we need to do, folks, there's, there's two things that are working well. Uh, one of them is going to be advertisement. I've used advertisement for a cultural group of mine just last week where no one was coming. And for $20, I got 15 new people into the door. Now, it doesn't mean that's what's going to happen at a conference necessarily, but what it means is we can you can pinpoint people down to exactly where they live and you can pinpoint them down to exactly what they like. Um, my daughter's uh, uh, in drama. 
for instance, is and we put advertising for people who only like theater because the people who was going to go see a middle school uh, drama play unless they're interested in theater. So we're, we'll be able to really pinpoint this down and target our audience. But we need Facebook accounts from you guys. And making a Facebook presence, I'm going to show you how making a Facebook presence and a YouTube, I'm going to show you a YouTube channel. And it's working. I have absolute proof it's working. And um, it's a slow process. I've seen it work with polit politi polit political voices out there who are not mainstream voices in the media. And I've seen them go to a couple subscribers. Literally, literally, some of those people now have over 200, 300, 400,000 subscribers. Because if you have a voice and can talk about something that's very interesting to a lot of people, that will happen. I've started a channel, and we'll talk about that. But you need to have a Facebook account, folks. The reason is, is we need to, if you don't want to do it and participate, great. But just get yourself a Facebook account and then start liking what's on there in the, the CMPS web uh, Facebook page. We have the Facebook page out there. You can like us. And we also have an event for the conference. And when I go and I start paying money, uh, it's not that much, but to start advertising so we can get in people we, we need you there. We need all the people here. We have literally, we're arriving close to 300 members. Paid up members are never have been so high. We're, we're approaching 70, 80, 90. We've never even been close to that, meaning people who are paid up to dues today. So we continue to grow. We continue to get new people, but we need you to participate. You can't sit, you know, those who sit back and let the world fly by. This is the way it works today, and it works. So please get yourself a Facebook account. If you haven't, I had to change the uh, the um, uh, the event because I, somehow I had three events. I was afraid to delete it. So I had three events. I had to delete one, and some people already said they are going to it. So you have to redo it. If you haven't done it, and if you're not going, go to our event for CNPS 2017 Vancouver, and you can mark interested, okay? These things help. If you go to a place that's supposedly a fun club, you walk in, there's nobody there, you're going to walk out. So the idea is we, need, we have hundreds of members around the world. Every one of them should have a Facebook page, and every one of them should be there. That should be the two minutes that you take out every week. I mean, my goodness, it'd be different if it was like a lot in, 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 and we're all worried. Can people read my stuff? We got to do this for this to happen, folks. I mean, you're lucky. At least we're trying to do do this and it's working. My, my, my rule is you don't do it. It doesn't, you don't, it's not going to help you. So at least help out the, the organization. So you want to go here. It says Mark going or interested on our Facebook event. Uh, we'll be paying for it. We will target those living close to the university and who like science, physics, and cosmology. Uh, you, you, UBC IDs get in free. I'll show you that. This is our ad. Um, if you look back here, th this, this is not an ad. If you look at this and you never saw anything about us in your life, you know, uh, CNPS 2017 or international conference next. Now, if you see this using our, our marketing tools, which is critical thinker, crit critical thinkers conference, taking on mainstream science. There's a picture of Mr. James Maxlow. He sent us really beautiful picture. UBC at Vancouver. It's small enough because it fits on phones. Guess what, folks? Most people are going to see this on their phone. There's every student probably at uh, the University of British Columbia in Vancouver has a Facebook account. They all have laptops and or phones. So these are things that are all planned out. So this thing is the reason it's very simple is because it's got to be that. And the way Facebook works is you put as much money as you want, anywhere from $20 to $100, whatever, say you want it during this time, they spread it out over that time. What happens is when people are on Facebook and they're a science, let's say they're a physicist student at U UBC, they're very likely going to see this come up as if it's somebody posted it right to their timeline. And that's how Facebook has become, they have become billionaires doing this and it really, really works. So that's my goal, but we need people to like this so that when they go there, they go, what? Well, there's only like two people going. So we need you to help and that's why. All right. Now, social media is working and I'm going to tell you, 
my experience, and I've only done this in the last two weeks, and it's really worked. I've been watching social media for the last two years, how people work at, how they do it, and this, it works and is working for us. So Albert Einstein has a Facebook page, for those who you don't know, and that is now bringing interest to the CMPS. We know that for a fact. Uh, this page has almost 20 million likes. That means 20 million people. In fact, Facebook page for Albert Einstein was squatted by this lady who registered it first because Albert Einstein's not alive. That happens. She then took it over. Next thing she knew, she had a, a money-making machine on her hands because people were signing up left and right because they all worship Einstein. So much so that if you don't know about Genius, who's running right now, Genius is the series that is Ron Howard is producing, and there's a couple of Academy Award people, three, I think, involved between producers and the actors, and it's about Genius called Einstein. Uh, uh, it's called Genius, about Einstein's life, super dramatic. It, it's re it, it, you don't like, you don't want to watch it. They're just worshiping this guy to death, making him into some god, and that they have actually paid this lady. It's obvious they've paid because now the banner for Albert Einstein is the banner for this uh, program. So that, that means this is making money for that lady. And so they, the, the Einstein's picture from real picture is now changed to the Einstein actor. Well, I don't know if he won Academy Award. He's the older actor who does it, or it's the younger guy who got the Academy. I don't remember, but that is totally taken over. But they, they keep putting scenes there. And Dave D. Hilster comes along and says, well, wait a minute. This, you guys are worshiping Einstein. We've got to stop worshiping him. There are problems, blah, blah, blah. There's problems with this. There's problems with that. Um, so much so that I kept putting stuff there and they kept, the people are looking at it, including the owner of this page of 20 million people who is now getting money for this. They watch what I'm doing. In fact, the last two things I've posted there, which are video responses from my, my YouTube channel, have actually gotten laughs, the ha-ha, from the person himself, themselves. Two things that means that I am being polite. Um, as you can see in the bottom part of this slide, I said David remains polite and presents all alternatives. I don't go calling them names. I don't call them idiots. I go and I go there with real challenges, with real words in very positive ways. And I, I keep co constantly harping on don't worship. And I get a lot of people out of the 20 million agreeing with me. I will say, we've got to stop worshiping. Genius is illusion. Uh, Einstein's relativity really has a lot of problems. We got to stop this. But this is really coming from, if you watch some in my YouTube channels, I talk about talk about this. And that's really coming. This is all coming from this whole Einstein push and Ron Howard. He said, oh, it's because Trump says, oh, there's no climate change. Oh, that means he is against um, uh, science in general. And therefore, we now have to launch, we'll use Einstein. Oh, by the way, we don't check if Einstein, in fact, is right or wrong, but we'll make him into a god because um, he has such an interesting life. And then, of course, they explain all of the funky things, but there's a lot of people who are skeptical, skeptical about Einstein. And every time I read something, I post it many times, I will make a video response to what I see there. And not only say, I disagree, here's why, blah, 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 take a look at this, that drives people to my YouTube channel. So that's, that's working. So let's take a look at how that works. Um, I call it Dissident Science. Actually, I made a podcast in 2015 called Dissident Science. It's dissidentscience.com. Uh, I interviewed a number of people, I think some of them maybe even here, and then it went sort of by the wayside um, for many different reasons. And next thing I know, this year, 2017, I start getting emails from people saying, why did you stop? I've been listening to all your podcasts. Love it. The podcasts are actually on Apple Podcasts channels. So they are there. I haven't checked on, on the number of people who had listened to them, but it's probably enough. And so that got me the idea of making this channel because I've seen people in the political arena who are reporting on things that mainstream won't report, won't report making their own uh, uh, YouTube channels. So um, what what we want to do is is look at this and emulate what works. So that's what I did. Um, I started only le probably about two weeks ago. I've already had 500 views on this. The one, one in particular, I'll show you, really generated a lot of fuss. And um, uh, this, I, my subscribers, I had none. 
I really didn't have anybody out there too much interested. And I've gone to 18. Now you, it doesn't sound like it. I've seen this exact same pattern go on with people in the politics, really great speakers on their subjects. And it just takes time for people to find them. These people start out slow it's like this curve and then it starts to really take off and i think if you watch some of what i'm doing i have the ability to really take topics and really talk about where things go wrong especially since i'm a linguist and i know what words i try to i've spent all my what 35 years trying to get computers to understand what the meaning of words are you know meaning of words and science are just full of space time and the fabric of space time and and things like that um, exotic is used a lot now, and those are in my pod, my, my uh, YouTube channel. So it is, it is quite good. I think it, it is bringing uh, interest. And one of the ladies who listened to the podcast is now writing two papers for this conference. Her name's Lori uh, Gardy. She um, wa- works as a, I think, image person or something like that with a bunch of physicists. She starts talking against the mainstream. They all look at her. And literally, she said to me, I had a long phone, phone conversation with her, with me. She, uh, we call, uh, talked to each other on the phone. And she said, well, I don't want to... Um, people came up to her and says, look, you may be right that this is wrong, but I don't want to change my worldview now. Meaning I've spent too much. They literally say that to at least they're honest. That to me is at least an honest answer. They go, I don't want to change my worldview. It could be all wrong yet, but don't, don't tell me. (laughs) But she is one of the people that is literally writing in our proceedings that came in this direction. And there are more and more people and they're, they're signing up to subscribers. Um, Here's an example of how this works. They posted on the Einstein 20 million like page about how the 1919 eclipse was proof for general relativity. Now, of course, um, they already know and they've heard arguments and they were trying to dispel the argument of of, uh, which I believe is true, which is uh, Dr. Edward Dowdy, the guy from NASA, who we all know, uh, extinction, he calls it extinction, extinction shift theory, but most important to me is that in coronas of suns, light bends, that it's refracted through mass. That's mass, there's mass in space, and therefore the light is bent. As soon as it gets outside that mass, it doesn't bend, even though Einstein says it should bend. So that's something that I think um, uh, was very interesting. So what did I do? I made a, uh, uh, I think it was an eight, oh, nine minute YouTube channel video. I have this software. If you want to do it, I'll tell you how to do it because it's free software. It's open source source software that I use. It allows you to record the screen, put your, you have a webcam, put it where you want, sort of position it. And I positioned this and I did this talk and I called it selling flawed general relativity. You can see that right next to it on this page. And boy, did that look, it's 197 views. Now you may not think that's a lot. That was in a couple days because people were going livid because I took what was on the Einstein site. I not only made a comment, but I made this video. When I went to make my comment, I made a link to it. And so when people are looking at it and they're going through, oh, here's this guy, David guy, they go through and then you start getting conversations on this webpage. And Lori, Lori Gardy said, I was, she, she, she said, this is great because she was getting her, what she says, her getting her chops and being able to argue with these people. You know, it takes a while. I'm, I'm pretty good with arguing because you can cut through what they try to do is get you on details and you have to get them right back from the beginning and say, you know, I can't even get where you are because I can't get past the assumption. So, so um, that's very interesting. So if you look at that, that um, we'll take a look on the next slide. And here's the actual conversation from the YouTube channel video that you just saw. Here's the top guy. I don't even know really who he is. Thank you for making these videos. I will watch them after work today. Um, there's quite a people, a lot of people who are liking them. Um, this also was a video where I first started getting negative thumbs downs. I was always getting thumbs ups because the people who are watching them enjoy them. I was getting thumbs down because now the people are mad at me. That means you're touching uh, uh, a nerve. So that's pretty cool. And if you look here, there's Laura uh, Gardy. She talks about, isn't this ref- uh, that couldn't be done by reflect fraction? And I said something there. Also, this isn't everything. You can go to my channel. It's pretty easy to get to, but you can read that. And there's some, there's some pretty, you know, uh, art, big argument, a lot of arguments going on there. But the good thing is it's driving people toward us 
I notice that our, our views go up, our YouTube videos for our CMPS video channel go up. Um, I notice comments coming on my stuff. People look me up in some weird Wikipedia of kooks, and there I'm at, and they go, is this you? And I go, no, that's not me. I'm in the Wikipedia, the wiki.naturalphilosophy.org. It's much more flattering there. <laughs> so anyways, it's very exciting. And so this is why I'm telling people this stuff works. Of course, um, I... If you make a channel, there's certain things you have to do. You have to do them regularly. And the way people do them now is you, you can pick a topic, put it together. Usually takes me less time to produce produce the, uh, I mean, to get ready for the, um, I'm sorry, there's a lot of noise here. Sorry about that. But um, it takes me more time to make the video than it does to actually produce. So once you get all this software, if you're interested in doing this, I'll let you know. But um, I'm going to play you the video which is my channel trailer. Yes, your channel has a trailer. And so if you subscribe to it, people will see this almost daily. I do it probably like this weekend. I haven't done it because I've been really busy. But normally a person does it at least every day, at least five times a week. And people expect that and they go, oh, this he, he's an interesting talker. He talks the way I like it. He's, I'm learning a lot about all these things I was always worried about uh, in science. So let's take a look at my trailer. And you will notice something. I have a tag, front tag, and back tag. When you do a YouTube channel, you have to have a, a memorable phrase, something that people can grab onto. And I thought hard and long. My first one didn't have one. I knew I needed to have one because they all have one. And you'll see. So be very aware of what I say in the very beginning and the end because those are my tags on every video. I come in with a script saying I'm David Hilser, blah, blah, blah. Okay, remember, blah, 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 blah. I'm David Hilser. Ciao for now. So those things are repeatable. Just take a look because it's important that I'm not be the only one out here doing this. I'm going to mute my mic because these idiots are doing stuff outside. Hold on and I'll play the video. And then I'm here to tell you the truth about science. Something your university professor won't tell you, the mass media won't tell you. Hello, this is David D. Hilster. I'm a critical thinker, science dissident. I'm here to tell you the truth about science. Something your university professor won't tell you, the mass media won't tell you, and certainly the science evangelist won't tell you. This is a very different channel on science. Yeah, let me get my. Yeah, you're getting it twice. Yeah, I'm getting it. Ray Redburn. I'm going to try it again. I had my, my, my mic on, and I think it was doing a feedback through the mic. It's only a minute, so it's not a big deal here. Let me try it again. Hello, this is David D. Hilster. I'm a critical thinker, science dissident. I'm here to tell you the truth about science. Something your university professor won't tell you, the mass media won't tell you, and certainly the science Hello, this is David D. Hilster. I'm a critical thinker. We're okay. I just need everybody to stay off their mics as well, okay? Let's try to get through this once, and then we can make comments, okay, everybody? I think it's working now. If you don't see it move, listen to the words, okay? Just depends on your connection, how good it is. Also, I can I have a link where you can go and watch this for sure. All right, so let's try it again. Hello, this is David D. Hilster. I'm a critical thinker, science dissident. I'm Someone has the mic on. That's the problem. I don't hear you, David. Hello, this is David D. Hilster. I'm a critical thinker, 
Science Dissident. I'm here to tell you the truth about science. Something your university professor won't tell you, the mass media won't tell you, and certainly the science evangelist won't tell you. This is a very different channel on science. Nothing you'll see anywhere like it in the world. We go after mainstream and all those cockamamie ideas, but we have real scientists looking at these problems and looking at mainstream who have PhDs, who are professors, who are engineers, respected around the world. Thousands of us who don't buy a lot of this theory, physics theory. In fact, theoretical physics is sort of an oxymoron. You really can't have something physical and theoretical at the same time. So if you are a person that is skeptical about relativity, plate tectonics, maybe you think the Earth's expanding like we do, you're, you're skeptical about the Big Bang, what the heck is that, and many other things, including particle physics and the zoo of particles that make no sense, have no physicality, and you agree perhaps with Dr. Alexander Unzerker, a physics, physicist from Germany, somebody like myself and many of us who think we should throw out particle physics altogether. But we love real science. We are mostly engineers and professors. We don't believe in fairy tales. So if that's the kind of thing you want to see, then you should subscribe to this channel. We're going to be looking at up-to-the-date articles, blogs, videos, and tearing them apart and showing you where all the mumbo jumbo and the double talk is and what to really look for and some even great things that the new people outside the mainstream are doing so you don't want to miss it the only place in the world you will find this kind of discussion i'm dave b hilster and remember this don't take what anyone says on faith stay critical stay thinking i'm dave d hilster your science therapist ciao for now Hello, this is David D. Hills. Okay, you saw, you saw that. I mean, uh, I thought a lot about about the tag beginning and end. Um, it's been going very well, like I said. Um, I'm getting views all the time when I put out a new video. You know, it depends on the video. Sometimes I get only a few, like 15, 17, or I get as many as a couple hundred. And it continually grows. Uh, the number of subscribers and when I tell people about it. And it certainly voices a lot of the things that I think most of the people talk about. In fact, I have one of my, I think I've got 12 of them out already. I'm putting out, like I said, at least five a week, sometimes even a couple a day. I wear my t-shirts. Here we go. See there? College. Um, but uh, these are from, my, actually, I bought them for the movie, never used them, but I use that. And I do them for several places. Sometimes I do them here for my wife's store or I'll do them in my office there, as you see. But this is working quite well. And what I encourage you is if you're a person that can go off on a, on a, on a subject and really talk about it and, and really engage an audience, I'll be happy to work with you to get the software. The software I use is called OBS, Open, Open Something Studio. And uh, it goes, I think, almost on every machine, both PC and Mac. It's free. So it allows you, all you need is to have a, a, a webcam like we have here. And of course you can then do your channel. You need to get some channel art. If you look at the channel art, uh, you gotta sort of do it nicely. Let's see if I can go back to, to uh, the uh, uh, slides here. So there it is. If you wanna see that, go to trailer.dissident or you can actually go to youtube.dissidentscience.com and also see that going on. So um, I appreciate your time. I'm going to have to get going here because uh, my wife's door opens and I made the excuse of, of uh, coming here before it opens. So I got some time, uh, which I don't always get. So remember, you need to reserve your CNPS 2017 room now. Uh, the university, I'm, it's, it's kind of a very precarious situation. If I get rid of them, no one's going to have them. If no one takes them, we've got to pay for them. It, it's... Uh, like I said, every conference has its uh, stickler part, and that's what this is. You can finish your paper. People are finishing their papers up by June 30th. Even if you have one now, even if it's all written in Word, we can help you get it to that. I'm pretty quick at that. Um, this year, new this year, we have a video presentation. So uh, Lori Gardie, who lives in Canada, who said if she can make it, she'll try to make it there in person. But if she can't, she uh, will pay a $50 fee this year, this is new, and she'll be able to talk for 45 minutes. If you're coming to the conference when there's few people, 
It is actually great. I like conferences that are smaller because you know why? We get all get 45 minutes, sometimes an hour. So we get to talk about it and really discuss. It's really amazing. So if you, you're you sort of on the edge about going to the conference, you can present, you can talk. And that's really one of the great things. Um, also, we'll be streaming it again on Facebook Live. YouTube has streaming, but you got to set it up ahead of time. Unless somebody was willing to do that, Facebook Live is much easier. And we do record everything, and we put them on the website pretty quickly because I have a camera, and we just let it go. We don't do any editing. And uh, that worked out pretty well last year. And again, folks, use Facebook, social media, get your account Mark, you're interested in going to our event. Watch the Dissident Science channel. Say hello. Engage in the conversations there. Think of it yourself. Don't like what I'm saying? Make your own damn channel. Excuse my language. And um, that's I can help you do that. Because today in age, what's happening is, is there's a critical thinking out there among especially young people and a lot of people politically, and they're all starting to question everything that's thrown at us. This is a real ripe time. This, the people who are establishing themselves now on YouTube channels are, have gone in within a year to, to having great voices and great, saying great things to being people who are listened to by hundreds of thousands of people. So we, we, we got to get into the same thing. And people are listening and liking it. You saw on that one saying, hey, I love these. Keep them up. Makes me think. So start your own YouTube channel. Um, so that's pretty much it. I've got a few more minutes if there's any questions, discussions. Mad, mad at me for whatever I've done. and I don't know. But anyways, thank you so much for, for letting me take some time here this morning. All right. Thank you, David. That was terrific. Um, now I have some questions. Now the conference runs from Wednesday till Saturday. Do you have a uh, like a preliminary idea of like when James Maxwell will be? Well, oh, um, he's going to be there the whole, whole time. He's going to be there the whole time. What time will do? You, is there a day that he'll be speaking? And there's also a. Uh, um, a yeah, yeah, we're going to be getting that later on. But he'll be speaking um, on Friday. Friday is the prime time. Friday evening, he'll be receiving the Lifetime Achievement Award, which of course is uh, quite modest for his work. And he will be giving a, a, a talk. We plan to normally when we do something like that, we give them a, a, an afternoon because some having somebody like that, a real celebrity, in my opinion, and really in a subject area, like I said, I'm just dying to talk to them. If you, by the way, um, just as an aside, go to wiki.naturalphilosophy.org. On the very first page, you'll see a, a click for expansion tectonics. Read it. It's about 34 pages put into the wiki. It's the best encyclopedic entry for expansion tectonics that exists in the world. It's on our wiki. Why? Because I asked Mr. James Maxlow to do it. I put it on there. Read it, read it, read it, especially the part where he talks about mass increase. So yeah, the, the actual schedule, he will be arriving actually on Wednesday. We fly him on, fly him a day early would have cost us $300 more. So he's arriving on Wednesday. He'll be there Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and fly back Sunday. So we'll even have time with him offline. So it's a really uh, uh, an amazing thing. And we will be putting together the schedule. Usually who does that is I'm going to get uh, Nick, Nick uh, Percival, who's one of the directors. Uh, he'll be putting that together. He usually looks at the papers and organizes those. We have one evening, which is going to be a Thursday night, which will be at Duncan Shaw's house. He lives in a very nice house. He if, if, if you don't know Duncan, he was one of the uh, Supreme Court justices of Canada. He's now retired, and he's an ether theorist. Theorists, I can't say it. So that that goes. So the actual conference runs from Wednesday morning to Saturday at five o'clock. Uh, many people stay through that whole time because if you're going to go there, it's really really beautiful. We're, my father and I are flying in Tuesday evening, flying back on Sunday. All right. Now, I was also interested, so uh, I saw, took a peek at your Dissident Science channel in YouTube, and you've got like five videos. But as a channel, uh, are, do you also put links to like other people's videos? Like if we want to. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. In fact, what you do with the channel is I have about, I think I have 12 videos now on the channel, and, and they will, I will start adding them again this weekend. And what you do is on your YouTube channel, you can, you can um, how do you say, um, customize it. 
one of the things you can customize are your liked videos. So if you go there and look at the bot, go scrolling down on that channel, you'll see liked videos, um, including one I put for um, uh, a 1992 or 93 lecture by John Chappelle. I put that there. So what you do is a what will happen is people like what I'm saying, people like my you know philosophy, my point of view. They're going to say, oh, what does David also like to look at? And what happens is then you all I have to do is as a as dissident science uh, as logged in in Gmail. Uh, in Google as dissident science, I then go to any YouTube. Anytime I click a, uh, a like, that will appear. So what I normally do is I will go around and click on things. So if there's especially some, if I like a talk for the CMPS, it'll be there. So people will come there and they'll also see that. Uh, also mention things also in my video. So yes, you can absolutely with your um, a channel recommend other videos that you like that, of other people. And there's so many of them. And I do talk about them. I already talked about, if you haven't seen it, take a look at the one I do on, I believe I did it, on this guy who's modeling. Um, I'm trying to get him into the organization. He's modeling expansion by making these teeny little balls, making them all gravitational, and then it's putting more in the middle. And you can watch the earth crack apart. And they're literally only calculated by using gravity, gravity calculations using a physics engine. It is amazing to watch. It shows um, he, he's working on that software right now. So once in a while, I will actually um, go ahead and have something up there that is. Uh, so I'm just uh, sharing that with everyone talk, your, your uh, YouTube page here. So if I send you about a link, you know, to, uh, view, all you have to do is have Skype. Oh, you, I lost you. Yeah, I think you're cutting out there for Is a second. There. No, uh, well, I thought you were cutting out. <laughs> I think everyone okay. got lost there for a second. But uh, I was just saying right. that looking at we're looking at your science uh, YouTube channel. Go here. down. And so Go if, down. if I want to, I, I can send like a list of uh, like my videos or something that I think people might be interested. You could uh, like those and then they would show up on here. Uh, no, you, you can't do them it yourself. Um, but I'm, I have uploads. It should be showing videos. That's kind of strange. Um, I think you have to be, Oh, I know what it is. You have to be subscribed to it. If you subscribe to this uh, channel, then you will see the videos that I like. I think that's part of the process that is the subscribers get something and what they get are links to videos that I like. Okay. So you have to subscribe to this first. Yeah, that's that's the okay. that's the that's the idea of a channel. <laughs> but you still have to like the video. So, like I said, I'd have to send you if I wanted to. Well, yeah, if you have a video that you want there, or better yet, Franklin, you know, uh, once you know, I uh, again, if you look at it, I have almost five hundred views already. I've got I know, only eighteen subscribers, but like like I said, that's in two weeks' time. I think it's going. It, it usually multiplies pretty quickly. Then what happens is if you have something, you can either send it to me and say, hey, do something on this. And I, I myself can can talk about it or I want to be interviewed. Uh, Franklin, you know, uh, interview me about this. And I'll take a look at it and then it says, OK, that may is interesting. And then we'll do an interview. They don't go very long because people in these things, once you get established, people will watch videos on these channels. They'll watch them in the beginning for, you know, numbers of minutes. But with time, they will start to watch them um, as long as I've seen these people now have as long as an hour long video. So any other questions from people? I have a question, but not on these uh, subjects. I have a question about the wikis. Uh, yes. We talked uh, a few times ago about how to uh, make documents for wiki. Yes, and uh, I hesitated to uh, to use the wiki language uh, system. In the meantime, I've learned to to use that uh, system, but I use it on uh, the uh, Wikimedia Foundation system. You know that right. that kind, and I uh, I wonder if uh, they use the same kind of editor. So um, that that's I a good can, question. Good I, question. If I can uh, use papers written for the one also on the other side uh, system. Good question. Mick, Mick, uh, MediaWiki.org 
is the open source software for wikipedia.org um yeah. the one that and, and the in, the installation of our wikipedia our wiki uh, wiki.new natural philosophy.org is in fact the exact same software it's identical in fact i actually also imp in, in, in how do you say imported thousands of templates so those templates where you see the boxes on the side yeah, yeah. believe me it took me approximately 20 hours of programming and downloading and installing to get the wikipedia where it's at plus i imported our database into that so the answer is 100% yes it's exact same software as wikipedia well, I, I have constructed um, um, a project on uh, Wikiversity. You know about Wikiversity? And yes. I have constructed there a project about the Helper book model. And it has now 16 pages. So it's okay. a fairly complete uh, project. And I'm currently translating it in uh, German and in uh, uh, Dutch. It is, was uh, originally written in English. But that's not my native language, so uh, mm -hmm. I'm uh, translating it back into Dutch, and uh, I'm halfway there. So okay. uh, if, if you're interested and see, and if we can uh, uh, also use that same page, I don't know uh, how um, Wikimedia is uh, thinking about using these pages and on the, uh, another Wikimedias. There's no problem. Uh, what you do is you just cite it. Um, as long as you cite what's in Wikipedia, you can you you can a lot of times just copy it. You just give it copyright. I, I know saying, I know how to copy. Right, that, that's no but problem. It, it, yeah, so you it, whatever you do there can be you can. It's literally a, co a copy and paste. There's a way, of course. There's an export and import in all the Wikimedia. So that's what I do uh, when I have some something that I had that I had to bring in, like a template. You can just take it from the wiki that you're in, export it then we can import it. You just sign up for a user who you are. It's not anybody can sign. It's not like Wikipedia where anybody can do it because then it just turns in consensus again. But if you sign up for the wiki, the, our wiki, and I know you say, David, this is me, um, and then you can go ahead and put the, put the stuff in. If we don't like it, we, 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 we know what's going on because what's good about Wikipedia is you can look at recent edits. Well, I, fact, I, there are two new... Yeah, I will. I will start uh, to uh, to transport some pages out of uh, the uh, Herbert Book Model project to the uh, CMPS wiki, uh, and if that okay. works, we can easily exchange things. Then. Absolutely, absolutely. Let me try Maybe to do that. Okay, no problem. No problem. That that sounds very good. Any other questions about the conference? The um, if you're like I said, if you're interested in doing a YouTube channel, take a look what I'm doing. Go to especially go to Einstein. Number one thing, people, is be polite. Don't call people idiots and all that kind of stuff. Um, you just got to be polite and then get your stuff in. They're allowing me to be there. Like I said, it's really a big deal if you don't if you don't know anything about so, uh, social media. When you have a site that has 20 million people and the person who's in charge of that site actually looks at your comments, they get literally thousands of comments a day. They know I'm there and they've been allowing it. So, and because I've been polite, I don't go there and I don't spam them. I don't go and I don't sit there and say to them, hey, hey, me, 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 come to my site. Ah, this is all baloney. No, you have to do it in a very tasteful way. But you can, you can see if you go in there, you will see. If you see a comes about social media, you can see it's been taken over completely by the movie. Ron Howard and those guys are paying this lady a lot of money. Why? When you have 20 million eyeballs, it's worth a lot of money. So she's making a living off of it. So, and I know if she's smart, she knows controversy will brings eyeballs to it. So I think that's one of the reasons she's allowing me. And I'm also, like I said, very polite. I don't go and make fun of people. I just say this guy's wrong. We have to stop worshiping him. That kind of thing. But you can go down that, the, down that, like I said, and you will see. Um, uh, I did one. Oh, there, oh. There's one. So it's mind-boggling to me. I just can't wrap my head around the concept of ripples in time and space. See, there you go. There's a person that I put my uh, black hole stuff there, and um, there you go. 
So yes, they are detecting something, but it isn't mythical waves. So there you go. All righty, uh, any other questions? No, well, then I can let you go back to what you were really, what you guys really do is talk about real science. I hope. All right, thank you, David, for coming by and uh, and giving us a presentation on the conference. Um, I hope uh, that that uh, more people come. Like I said, right now there's not a whole lot of people signed up, but uh, but go on to the registration site. And um, so uh, you did mention, so that there's like, a, there, there's registration fee, it's like $150 if you are speaking, and $200 yeah. if you not. Yeah, yeah, it did go up this year. The reason it went up, because I now include the t-shirt and the proceedings. Before those were separate, I said, forget it now, just pay 150, you get everything. You get the proceeding, you get a t-shirt and the registration. So it's really, it really hasn't changed in price. So, uh, you know, that's not a big price to pay because, you know, getting there is, is the bigger price and staying. And it also looks like that if you're not attending the full conference, it's like $50 a day or something like that. Yeah. And there are people that do that. And hopefully, if, as long as we can get lots more people onto our Facebook page and our Facebook event, my hope is then I'm going to start uh, in about a month ahead of time. We're going to pay some money from our our pockets uh, from the CMPS to start advertising so we can get, we did it very briefly at the other conferences and we got people in. I know this will, will bring some interest, even if there are people who are skeptical, but um, I think that's something we can do. So, uh, um, so we may even get somebody who's close, who more on our side and will actually pay to be part of the conference. So, but if they have an ID, they can get in free. So if you're, if you, if you are here and you're a member of this university, you don't have to pay. So uh, uh, how are you arranging for having people talk? Are you making a schedule on that? Are people, they yeah. didn't see anything in, in the registration page yeah. particularly. About, right. Like, we will have, them. we will, yeah, we will have that. We will have that um, probably, normally we have, we start on that three weeks ahead of time. So three weeks ahead of time, we'll be knowing. Uh, we do have in registration, on the registration page, it has a place. Click on the pages you will, the days you will be there and the days you talk. If you do not do that, you will be scheduled wherever. So that's not a problem. You can do that right now. It costs you nothing. All you have to do is log in, literally click on the stuff and say save. When you do that, everybody who's going who wants to talk, tell us the days that you want to talk. And we will schedule you on those days. We always have to change it a little bit. That's always the case. So, okay. Let's see here. Uh, let's see. I can share the registration form so people can see what that looks like. Yeah, I'm going to get going here in two minutes. So, all right. Yeah, I'll just. Yeah. So that's now the registration see... form. Right. Yeah, if you click on it, once you click on some of those things, uh, you, you can unclick them. But if you click click on those uh, boxes there in the registration, go ahead. Um, you'll see that you can choose those days and everything. And then if you go to the bottom, go down, um, right? If you go down at the toward the bottom, then you can say what you're affiliated, your flight info, and then you just hit the save button. Lodging has. Um, where we are or others, all we have. We don't have, I don't have any other things other than the two, the, the place we're staying because it's pretty expensive there. And then if you click also on the uh, payments, click on that payments um, link right there, you'll see then what the, the if you are at the very top, uh, scroll down a little bit, you'll see abs absentia. That means you don't pay anything for it. That's you're just in, the reason is, is if you are submitting our, our uh, art, uh, kind of cut out, on there, David. Huh? You kind of cut out on this, sir. Okay. Yeah. Once you click on the speaker registration, uh, put um, if you go down, if you can make a click on that, uh, cl uh, go down and page fee. Put in like five pages. Uh, there in the quantity. And as you see, you put those in there. I've programmed it so that it automatically makes the uh, thing uh, down there. It uses jQuery. So let's say you want to go one to the banquet. There you go. Go down further. And then uh, on the page, 
and you'll see if you go down further, you'll see the pay now. You can click on that, and then that takes you to PayPal. And if you do it wrong, we can always reimburse you. PayPal takes credit cards without you having a PayPal account. There's a big button there, so don't worry. Oh, I can't pay to PayPal. They're gonna. I get that now and then. So okay. Okay. Uh, easy peasy to register. So. Yeah, and one, uh, one other one other thing you can do: click on the uh, CNPS. 2017 annual on the right hand side below the yellow box the first link there you'll see the uh, first link there those yellow ones are for yourself the very top one CMPS annual now if you go there what you can do is you can also see reserve dorm go down you also see there um, uh, if you go down right there see uh, rooms you just click on that I want you to do that and that will take you to the uh, UBC and that's the standard room. There's another tab there that says budget rooms and shared apartments. If you click on that, that's the one most people are going to be staying in. So we need you to do that now if you are going. Okay? And you can change all the stuff up there. All right. I'm going to have to go. Yeah. No, this is you, uh, Canada dollars. So you can translate that to be about less than $200. That's going to be, for, I mean, less than $300 if you were to stay all those days. Which is pretty cheap. Most places, three hundred dollars won't get you maybe a night. So, and I know people are on fixed incomes. Alrighty, I've got to go. Thank you so much, uh, um, uh, Franklin, for everything you're doing on this. Thank you all for doing this uh, uh, here. I wish I could be here, but politically on Saturday mornings it's really tough. I've got to open my wife's door here before she gets here. So, thank you so much. Uh, I hope you take a look at the YouTube. Get your Facebook. Uh, going and keep up the great work and we have recordings of these I put the uh, latest recording on now on the so if you didn't see last week and word was here and want to see it it's up there on our website thanks so much see you later Franklin all right thanks David have a good weekend thank you maybe we'll have to open this door more often <laughs> okay so that was a lot of information about the conference and uh, how to promote ourselves so uh we've still got an hour so i wanted to open up the floor for uh things that people may want to talk about does anyone have anything on that they would like to talk about this morning we've had quite a few things go across the email hey harry uh, yes. yeah. you were talking about reading some historical accounts of uh i guess like uh, ether versus or whatever they thought the uh, electromagnetic wave propagation might be is is that a book that's available it sounded very interesting whatever it was you're reading um is that available someplace um from last week or something um to answer your question yes um is it um is it uh, in a book? No. Um, basically, what I was talking about was um, I'm not. Um, I guess I'm not really sure how to explain this, but basically, um, there. It, it, if you go back. Um, and look at the literature um, around the turn of the century. You go to Scientific American, which uh, was a weekly publication. There's what's called the Century Magazine. And there's also a number of newspapers. And what I uh, said was basically gleaned from reading those publications. There is a site that you can go to, and there are a number of websites that deal in this early history of radio. Um, and, but they don't, they have like some of this information there, but what I discovered in my research was that um, they generally tend to focus on what they're interested in and not necessarily give you the complete picture. Like for instance, I found um, primary references in um, some of these uh, sources that they don't include on these websites. So um, my 
suggestion would be to, to look at these websites and I can tell you the names of them if you're interested. So essentially you're digging, you're doing a lot of effort to dig out these things. It's not already summarized in a book or anything. Well, it might be, but um, <laughs> um, essentially I'll tell you what I've been doing. I'll describe it to you. What, if you go into the literature, there's a lot of books that have been written about the early history of radio, but most of them are generally deal with patents. They deal with the history. They deal with the economics. So you can find a lot of information about um, Lee DeForest and Reginald Fessenden and uh, Guillermo Marconi, and you can find a lot of information um, and a lot of detailed stuff about the history, and, and it's a big subject. There's a lot of books published on this, but there's really not a whole lot of people who've gone into looking at the equipment and trying to figure out what it is that, that the equipment how the equipment actually worked. Do you understand what I'm saying? So I'm interested in trying to understand why what they did worked and why the ones that didn't work, why they didn't work. Does that kind of make sense to you? Yes, that's, thank you very much. Uh, it's very interesting. Keep us posted. Now I'm sharing on the screen. So this is a reference came across this week in the email to this book. And I, I put the link in the chat which is, this is a book, and I thought this was, this was pretty interesting, um, which is uh, called 19th Century Ether Theories. Uh, I've read this book. I've read this book years ago. So what did you think of this book? Um, if you're interested in that particular, um, this uh, historical vision of it, they give you the... Uh, uh, version of history that uh, kind of uh, leads you to the assumption that uh, um, it, it's kind of written, you know, with the understanding that these are theories that really um, have failed to be productive, but they're interesting, and so we're going to talk about them. There, do do you understand what I'm saying? Well, it's kind of like history of pictures, right? That uh, looking well, at this, they don't really talk about radio and they don't talk about wireless because that doesn't fit the narrative. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, this one they're looking at. I mean, if we look at their contents, they're talking about uh, things like uh, uh, elastic solid ethers, whether an ether solid, electromagnetic ether. And they have All something. Right, me, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, let me get back to what Bob Gray was commenting on, Bob, if I might. Um, no. If you read the accounts, okay, the theory or the explanation of radio, and I prefer to use the term etheric wave, etheric wave, um, isn't the modern view of it, which is kind of the interesting point. The idea is that what they would do is when you would have a spark transmitter, okay, and what was happening according to the theory that they were going by when they developed radio was that you created oscillations of electricity, a motion of electricity that went up and down that oscillated in the transmitting wire, which we call an antenna. They didn't call it antennas in those days. Marconi used the term antenna, but there were a number of different terminologies, which is confusing. But anyway, the idea is that this electricity vibrating in the wire of the transmitter excited an oscillation of electricity in the ether. So, you had a sympathetic vibration of electricity in the ether created by a vibration of electricity in the antenna. That's basically the thought principle uh, that they were using. How is that 
different than the way they think of it today? Isn't it the same? Thing? Well, today, um, there's no concept of exciting vibrations of electricity in the ether because there is no ether. But they still have excitations of electromagnetic waves that then propagate to a receiver. No, that's not correct. Um, okay. The ether was envisioned as a medium and not um, uh, not empty space, if you will. Okay. It's kind of, it doesn't sound very, you know, I understand what you're saying. And it's sort of a subtle idea, okay? The idea is that um, the ether contained electricity, okay? And that's not the modern view. The modern view is that, that um, space is empty and it's a nothing. Okay. And mm -hmm. I think you cut out there a little bit, Harry. Can you repeat what you said? I thought that, uh, well, um, I said what I said. The The modern theory is this idea that you create, okay, I'll explain the modern theory probably as well as I can. The modern theory is that electrons are forced to move in the antenna by the impressed voltage that's supplied by the transmitter. So the impressed voltage of the transmitter causes electrons in the antenna to accelerate. And then the accelerating electrons in the antenna produce electromagnetic radiation, which then travels through space in some kind of not really very clear mechanism, which we discussed last week, as you'll recall. then presumably the receiving process is not quite as clear, but the idea is that the electric field in space that's oscillating causes electrons in the antenna to move. May I join this discussion a little bit? Um, it is possible to uh, take a field and let that field uh, pass, penetrate into material, into homogeneous material. Then when this happens, the, the field gets crumbled, scrambled, is crumbling up. But it is still a field and uh, on the average it behaves like a field. But the, for example, the uh, speed of the oscillations are much lower. It's like light entering a piece of glass. It's uh, similar as the electrical field is penetrating a metal. Uh, there is an interaction. In fact, it is the same field. But uh, inside the material, uh, some of the uh, material constants like permeability and uh, um, magnetization and, and all those things are uh, going to take a role. Well, I'm not really sure I understand what your point is. Um, uh, the real issue with the modern theory is that you have to, the modern theory says that the field, whatever that is, the electromagnetic field is created by the motion of electrons in the antenna. And, um, and then on the opposite side, the antenna on the receiver, the electrons in the antenna and the receiver are induced to move by the electromagnetic wave that passes by the wire. That's, yeah, but the, the electrons don't, don't enter into space, into free space, but the field does. Well, the problem is that this, how the field how the electron motion couples into creating a field is sort of obscure, in my opinion. It, it is the same field, only in the material, the field gets, uh, yeah, crumbled, crumbled uh, together. So uh, uh, the, the parts are getting lo uh, longer because uh, they have to pass along all these 
uh, atoms and have to uh, circumvent them. And uh, but but the, the same field can still oscillate, but the behavior of the oscillations are going to change. And that's where these uh, material constants are coming in that only are valid within the material. It is the condensed matter that behaves different from free space. But the field is the same. No, we well, I have no comment on that because I don't understand what you're saying. Well, I have written uh, a section in the Helber book model, and I have uh, put the link to that section into the chat box. So if you want to look there, but the field equations are exactly the same, only some material constants are coming in. So the, the, the field as a whole is uh, within the material, within the uh, condensed matter is behaving different uh, from uh, when it is uh, uh, traveling through free sp space. Well, the real issue is um, this, how does the field move through, move through quote, free space? And um, that's really the issue here. How does that happen? Well, uh, the whole the whole of the space is covered with, with, with fields. One of the fields is space, uh, space itself. Space itself is a field. It's not, there's a parameter space. That's uh, something mathematical. But uh, space itself is a kind of function that uses a flat para, a parameter space, but the field itself, the space itself is curved. Well, there was some controversy in the emails this week about whether what space is made out of. So um, some people want to make space a material substance. Uh, basically, they, they can't accept space as being nothingness um, yeah. versus the, the viewpoint I was putting forth, which is that space, empty raw space, really doesn't have anything in it and the only properties it has is that of dimensionality it has a spatial three-dimensional uh property and that is the only property that it has but people keep on insisting that even that kind of totally void empty space uh can must contain some kind of smaller particle and uh but I'd be curious to see, is, is, is empty space as a concept okay with other people? I mean, that just seems a very intuitive, obvious concept, that you know, space can be just totally empty. A, a field can be fairly empty. Well, Frank, let me, let me make a comment. First, I don't didn't receive any of those quote emails that you're referring to, so I can't comment on them. So. If you would, please uh, send me these emails. Um, could you do that? Okay, I'm, I'm surprised you're not on this massive email chain that not everybody. Well, I, I haven't, I didn't receive them so I can't comment. Okay. Um, the other issue is that the question that you raise is an issue that goes back to the ancient Greeks. Aristotle versus uh, um, Democritus, if you will. And um, if you read the uh, history of science, you'll find out that the uh, Aristotle completely objected to the notion of a void, a void uh, concept of space as a void. And um, so this question of whether space is a something or a nothing goes, has never been resolved. Let's see here, Larry. Boy, I got a lot of emails for you. Should I send it to your Yahoo uh, version? Or your email one? KC3MX.com. KC3MX.yahoo.com. Yahoo. Okay. I'll forward that to you. This is this is about uh, the, the topic is about the, the darkness forces are the source of the electric charge. So that's and I'm having a discussion with Robert Dubinis about this. 
and uh, Akimbo, who, who both insist that the void space uh, must consist of some other, you know, like plank bubble particle or something. Well, first off, here's the question. What does void space mean? Now, physics assumes a void space because physics adopted the point of view of Democritus, and Democritus said that uh, what exists is void space and atoms that move in the void space, and that's it. That's the physical concept. Um, so all you have is void space, nothing, and particles that move around in it called atoms. Okay, that's the concept. Physics has adopted that philosophical point of view. And um, having done that, um, their whole construct is based on that notion. The Aristotelian view was, no, space isn't a void, it's a kind of medium. Okay, and, uh, but physics rejected that notion. And um, so that's where they stand right now. Well, the, the hypothesis I was putting forth is like that, in which case, you know, we have atoms and we have uh, ponderable particles, uh, but instead of a complete void for space, uh, I, I'm saying that there must be some kind of medium for these electromagnetic waves to occur in. So I filled the, the, the void space, instead of being void, I filled them with, you know, uh, a medium which is just made out of positron electron dipoles. Now the question was, what is the space between even my little positron electron dipoles? And uh, they were arguing that there is still another substance even between the two positron electrons. But I would argue that there is uh, there are, there, are, there is no substance between the individual particles of my ether. So the ether fills space like sand fills a cup. And then between the individual sand grains, I claim nothing. Okay, let me let me go over this. Let me go over this uh, with with you. That's uh, Maxwell. Okay, developed his theory of electromagnetism based on the assumption that there was an ether. Okay, and he had a particular um, concept of what that ether was, that it was a material. He gave it mechanisms. Okay, there, and um, so that's the idea being that electricity is, is the effect of what happens in this ether. So in other words, it really, um, the, the effects of electricity are due to the actions that occur in the ether. Okay, now, when Einstein did away with the ether, okay, um, the idea became that we don't really need to have an ether. The only physical reality is this thing called the field. We don't need to explain how the field exists. We just take it as a given that there is this thing called a field that's described mathematically. And so what you have is the field, which is really nothing more than a mathematical entity in a void space. Well, that sounds a lot like the approach that Bill Lucas uh, uh, takes, that, that, the, that the field is fundamental. Although I disagree with that particular viewpoint. And I, I think I mentioned that uh, concepts of like field and uh, like Cornelius likes to use the word tension and uh, waves all definitely require the presence of a particulate medium. Well, not necessarily. You're putting in the word particulate. So you're assuming you're going back to the Democritus assumption that uh, what exists is void and something called atoms that uh, exist in that void. Okay, so you're making the assumption that there is a particulate um, thing that exists inside this void space. Yeah. No one has been able to demonstrate that, this, uh, that there is such a thing. Now, a lot of people have tried to say, 
okay, um, let's put something into this void space that um, carries these the field. And there's uh, some people say, well, it's a field of photons. Uh, Cornelius says it's a field of waves. Uh, some people say it's a bunch of energy waves flowing around. Lots of different ideas about what this thing is. Um, doesn't necessarily have to be um, a matter um, that fits in space. It doesn't have to be a particle or matter or anything like that. It could be just uh, a form of energy that exists inside there. Yes, that's absolutely true. It could be all those weird things. It could be, you know, unknown energy sources, as Mr. Spock would say in Star Trek. Or it could actually be made out of uh, ponderable matter, just like the same stuff we are. I mean, that's it, true, but then you would have to basically explain why nobody's been able to de de detect it. Oh, well, I explain that that people have detected it. It's just that, you know, they just can't see the forest for the trees. So, you know, like in pair production, I mean, where does the positron electron come from? You know, I say that comes from the invisible, you know, pre existing sea of particles that's out there. You know, we, we could say that, you know, space is actually made of, say, I don't know, like hydrogen atoms or something like that. But I think experimentally, we can rule that out because we can certainly suck out hydrogen atoms and then still something there. So it can't be like ordinary uh, matter like hydrogen or nitrogen or oxygen. It has to be some other form of matter which is harder to detect. I mean, it could be something like space could be filled with, say, neutrons. What if the, uh, the neutral... Um, Void is just filled with what we would normally consider neutrons is another possibility, but that would that would also be a uh, a way to make it so that the void is filled with a particulate matter substance versus a mysterious uh, say energy source, which I think would be kind of hard to explain. Because I I think that you know what we're trying to go for. The okay, well, let, let me just comment on this, uh, Franklin. The problem with a material ether as the medium for propagating electromagnetic waves is that you have to you have to give a mechanism whereby the electromagnetic waves are propagated through this medium. And the book that you cited that you showed me in the beginning, um, goes through a lot of attempts to do that, okay? There have been a lot of theories of the ether and a lot of attempts to explain how the ether transmits the electromagnetic force. And remember, you have to be able to explain not only the electromagnetic wave, but you have to explain the propagation of static magnetic and electric fields. And the problem is nobody was really able in a convincing way using the um, material ether theories that they were working with at the time to really successfully do that. And that failure in my mind to a certain extent was uh, contributory to the, um, how should I put this? When Einstein came along and said there was no ether, it seemed to me like, it, it, like people said, oh, okay, we've got this problem. We can't make this ether do what it's supposed to do. These ether theories really couldn't do what they were supposed to do. So it was kind of an easy thing to do to say there is no ether, and so we don't have to try to solve this problem anymore. Now, what you're doing is you're trying to solve this problem that people tried to solve before and were unsuccessful. Yes, I think they were unsuccessful because they could never really truly describe what their ether was made out of. I mean, uh, they, they're, they're trying to say that it's made out of some particular medium, but without being able to say what it mechanically was made out of. I mean, they, 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 know, they, they, they didn't even know whether it was made out of um, matter, like electrons and protons and neutrons, like we know, or it could have been made out of some exotic, you know, like, like uh, Al McDowell says, it, like space is made out of spiritons which is made out of some kind of matter which is utterly different than what we're normally uh, accustomed to. Or, you know, we have people have theories about what dark matter is uh, and, and wimps and other exotic particles. So I think their failure is in part because of their, their inability to, to describe that. 
So, and, and my idea is pretty simple. I, I'm saying that the particle is just a positron electron dipole, and that's it. I can't get any simpler than that. That must be like the simplest combination of any particle you can make besides setting a singular electron or singular positron. The next most complicated thing to make is a positron electron dipole. I'd like to read a, a portion of an abstract of a paper I found this past week. The paper is called Electrodynamics and Elasticity. The paper was published in American Journal of Physics in 2003 by Valery Dmitriev. And the abstract um, in part says, in the Coulomb gauge, electrodynamics can be formally mapped onto incompressible elasticity, which suggests that a linear, elastic, incompressible medium can serve as a model of electromagnetism. Now, when he says elasticity, I don't necessarily think he's talking a material as we know it, made up of atoms. It's just the properties, the mathematical properties of a linear, elastic, incompressible medium formally map electromagnetism. I find that very interesting. But once again, it really doesn't state, you know, what this incompressible medium is made of. You, uh, you must, you must. My, my, my. You're kind of cutting out on us there. Um, yeah, I, I've got it on now. Um, you must uh, bring the, the problem back to its most fundamental format. Um, what you are trying to do is to uh, explain how the real numbers are, are coming from the ra rational numbers. Rational numbers are uh, groups of um, uh, fractions that uh, are covering the complete system of real numbers. If you take uh, a convergent series of rational numbers they go to a say go to a limit but that limit doesn't need to exist within the rational numbers in the real numbers all these uh, limits exist and for that reason the real numbers are a continuum and the rational numbers are still countable so if you have discrete particles they are embedded in a continuum. The difference between what you think is uh, a kind of uh, medium that this eater, uh, you are think, still thinking in terms of uh, the rational numbers. And a field is something that you can compare to a field. It is a continuum. The, the whole thing is in the number systems. Uh, well, I don't think that physics is particularly numbers. I mean, I'm, I'm listening to this and, and I'm going, uh, no, I'm, this is not physics. Um, uh, rational numbers. Well, rational hold on, numbers, hold on, Franklin. He's making a pretty, he's making a, a real important point, but that goes to the other controversy about, uh, um, you know, discrete versus continuous. Um, and the topologies, uh, the discrete topology versus the continuous topology. And I think that's what you're getting at, Hans. And I understand what you're talking about. I'm not really sure Franklin and some of these other people will. <laughs> yeah, I don't understand. Sorry. Well, the idea, well, yeah, <laughs> okay. Uh, what he's talking about is, uh, gets in is is the mathematics behind physics so so if you're talking about physics okay you can talk about um you know doing experiments but then you have to have a theory and when you have a theory you have to have mathematics and as soon as you have mathematics then there's all these different types of mathematics that can be used to describe physics so which one are you going to choose well, I think it's interesting just to review kind of the problems we have with the ether. So 
one of the problems is that we don't know what it is. So it's kind of hard to find something we don't know what it is. Uh, number two, we have to figure out, well, how does this thing propagate uh, electromagnetic waves? And it seems that things like light and radio waves seem to be radically different, but they're supposed to be kind of the same thing. And a third problem is basically how a polarization works is another problem. Uh, how is it that we have these polarizing materials and uh, like that? All the noise. I think you've got a lot of kids in your background there. <laughs> uh, kind of sounds like you're in a daycare. Uh, so we have to deal with polarization. The other problem that we have to deal with is that this apparent uh, ether has to also propagate the magnetic field, not less the magnetic field that's also, not less the magnetic field is something completely different. But I think it would be preferable if the same ether could. Uh, also represent the uh, a magnetic field. And, and this is kind of like one of the objections I have to say the EPOA theory, which is a salt crystal like uh, representation of the positron electron C. So it's very similar to what I believe in, except that he freezes the entire space into a, a crystal, uh, an ordered crystal lattice. But uh, that would eliminate, say, my explanation for the for the uh, the magnetic field, which would actually have to be an orientation of the positron electron dipoles, because in order to have magnetic field, magnetic field has a direction and a magnitude. So, whatever physical representation you come up for the magnetic field must have those properties. So, if you can take a dipole and you can point it in one direction, that gives a direction, and the number of those dipoles that are pointed in that direction uh, would provide magnitude. So that would be an example of, of only one substance that would uh, be able to be compressible. And it, uh, this is why I kind of disagree with the, uh, uh, the conceptions of the ether being either a solid or being incompressible, because uh, only really compressible gas-like things can transmit uh, waves. And I think the waves that we see in radio are, are very, very comparable to the, the waves that we see in air, and we know how those ones work. So that's kind of some of the answers that I come up with. Now, there was an interesting discussion, I thought, about, you know, there's a, about whether a light is a particle versus a wave. And um, I think, you know, there, there is some agreement that, that light, which comes out of the atoms from an electron process, uh, have this quanti quantization property to it. So that the, the, the wave, the light waves that come out of these, ele these electron uh, transiting things, which is like visible light, do have these particle-like properties in that they occupy only a limited uh, finite space. So they're like, they would be like a single bump. Like if it was a wave tank, you'd go a single bump and a single wave would go across the tank. So I think, and that, that with single wave would contain a finite amount of energy, but it's still a wave. But it has the properties of a particle in that it a finite fixed size like a bullet, and it only and it only goes in one direction, like a bullet. So it, it has it has a frequency, but there would still be a longitudinal wave. Did you have a comment, Hans? I said it can be a bullet, but it still has a frequency. So it must have a finite length, and it must have that frequency within that finite length. Yes, it would have that. What we commonly consider the wavelength is actually the complete length of that bump that goes up and down. And I think the point was that That's if you correct. light coming from these electron-generated processes, you would find it is actually not continuous, not a continuous sine wave. That you'd see it's an individual <laughs> bump, another individual bump, Another individual bump, but they're all overlapping. 
And so it kind of looks like it might be a continuous wave, but it actually isn't. I mean, this is maybe why we get the photoelectric effect that um, it's just because every single time, the only thing that's actually hitting the atoms are the individual bumps of energy. And all these individual bumps all have the same amplitude. So it doesn't matter how many of them hit the surface. Uh, they're only delivering just that constant amount of energy. And they, they, it doesn't matter what the, say, the frequency is um, because they can only, they, they're all delivering basically the same amount of energy. Actually, I think, the, I think it doesn't matter if the wavelength matters, but the, the intensity doesn't matter. Is, is well, Franklin, I'd like to comment a little bit on this. And my comment would be, um, we're talking about too many different things all at once. And um, that, you know, there's a lot of confusion here. Okay. So, I mean, uh, now you're talking about photons and what a photon is. And earlier you were, you were talking about what magnetism was. And you know, so my view on it is, first off, you have to define what you mean by electric electricity and what you mean by magnetism. And then you have to decide something about the nature of those two things. And then you have to, based on that, you have to sort of figure out why, how do they act together to be an electromagnetic field, okay? So now you got a real problem there. You know, you've got magnetism, you've got electricity, you've got to put them together. Okay. Um, I don't, you know, to me, you just want to have to define the what you're talking about as you go along. And and you you can't just jump from, oh, we're talking about magnetism and now we're going to talk about photons. I mean, uh, it, you know, that this this it's just uh, a morass of confusion, in my opinion. Well, I think that part of the determining whether the truth, whether a theory represents truth, is probably your ability to do exactly what you're talking about, which is to smoothly transition from talking about one subject to something that seems completely different, but is actually all part of exactly the same thing. So, you know, I, I just transitioned from talking. So about, tell me what an electric, tell me, tell me what a magnetic field is and tell me what an electric field is and tell me what electromagnetic wave is. Okay. Well, first of all, we start out with the medium and this is my own pet theory. We start out with the medium, which is a positron electron dipole. Okay. So you fill space with all of that. Now, if you take an electron and you shove it one way through this medium, it's going to push. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What, where did this electron come from? What, what's an electron? You push the electron, increase the voltage. Those electrons push now out. Where wire? Where did the wire come from? Uh, the wire is made out of atoms. Okay, so now it's already getting pretty complicated. Uh, no, we, we have a lot of concepts, atoms. and I don't know what they mean. We just have atoms. We just have positive electron space. We create voltage. That creates a pressure in the positive electron C, which causes a compression and a rarefication. So that is a electromagnetic wave. So all you need to all you need for electromagnetic wave is a particulate uh, elastic medium. So that's the electromagnetic wave. Okay. Okay. So let me let me stop you now. So um, so you made the assumption that. Um, you have something called a positron, which Pos is electron. Positron, a positron electron. Field. Okay, so you've got something that creates an electric field, and the electric field has a positive and negative charge, correct? Yes, that's correct. So you have so now you've you've sort of defined the objects that your field that your medium consists of by the concept that you're trying to explain. So, you know, if you're trying to explain what an electric field is, you can't do that by uh, objects that assume the electric field exists. So you're saying an electric field is really basically something created by these particles. So let me explain the electric field, okay? 
Now you understand the concept of electromagnetic wave. That, is, like I said, is only a uh, rarefaction, rarefaction and compression of the particulate medium. Okay, so let me explain what the electromagnetic field actually is. Now, in, in my theory, you have to have a difference between what a, heck a positron is and what a heck an electron is. One of is possibly positive field charge, the other is negative field charge. What could possibly be the difference between those two? Now, the way that the, the way I explain it, and uh, in the email that I sent you about the projectionist forces, uh, there's this concept that um, I've explained this before that if you have a pulsing sphere and you have one pulsing here this way and you have another another one pulsing out of phase, so that creates a wave between yeah but the wave the medium for the waves to be propagated is this positron electron c so you're saying that the positrons and the electrons interact with each other when they're the medium so you have no yes, medium exactly that's that's the trick no that there is no medium the there's no level. medium how do they how do they interact when there's nothing to cause them to interact you're explaining the phenomenon by hypothesizing a medium that relies on the phenomenon that you're trying to explain. That no, no, actually it doesn't. The only thing you have to, first of all, really circular, presume, Franklin. the only thing you have to presume is that we've got one particle that's basically pulsing. You've got another particle. I, I understand this. I, I've heard it all before. Okay, I'm just saying it's circular reasoning to me. No, it's not circular. I'm trying to. We'll, let other, to we'll let other people decide about it. <laughs> it's not circular. Now, Harry, the thing is that once you've got one thing that's pulsing this way, it's in and out and in and out. Now, when you do this, you're getting an object which is basically the same size. It's actually no longer pulsing. And this is a positron electron, is that it actually becomes then a neutral object. See, now this is the only thing you need to propagate a wave is a neutral object that's not actually generating any waves on its own. So when you take a positron and electron together, they essentially do not have any kind of pulsing going on. So once, I, once you have your positron electron dipole and you put it next to something which is pulsing, then that is going to create a wave, right? So only the individual electron, which is going like this, can actually push the dipole away. So because this is a dipole, it is made out of positron electron, which is basically going like this, but because it's basically eating up the entire pulsing, it then becomes a non-pulsing neutral object. So it can serve as the medium for the wave of the individual electron. And this is what I'm saying is the electric charge, which is a very, it's just the resonant frequency of the electron, which is beating against the, the um, positive electron medium. And what we see, we see waves coming out of the electron. And we see that as the negative electric field. So the the key is the electric field is actually just an ordinary electromagnetic wave at, a, at probably a very, very high frequency. Other people who have looked at it says that this frequency is something in the 10 to the 20th hertz, which is like way beyond gamma. So what we see as an electric field is just an electromagnetic wave, just like light. This is why the electromagnetic field can travel infinite distances because it propagates at exactly the same mechanism as uh, light does, which can travel an infinite distance. So it's not circular, Harry. The trick is, is that when you get a positron and electron together, they absorb, they absorb the, 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 the resonant frequency so that they essentially become a different kind of particle which can serve as the medium to propagate all these waves. Now, the, the argument was what happens between an, a, a, when a positron and electron are right next to each other, right? Then there's nothing between these two to attract each other, right? There's no way that, that because the only way you can have attraction between positron and electron is if there's some other particles between that can propagate a wave. 
Now the question is, when these two things are right next to each other, you know, what keeps those apart? I claim nothing. There is no force that there's, the, this is where the empty space argument comes in, that between the positron electron and the positron electron dipole, there's actually no space between those two. Franklin, Franklin the, the electron and the positron have no arms to, to, to yeah, hold each other. If they were anywhere else, then their, their pulse would not be absorbed by their partner pair. Right? If they're anywhere else, then, you know, if it was like this, then they, they would get pushed. They would get pushed away until it found its opposite. So it's just a geometric argument as to why they pair up. But, you know, if you put some energy in it, you would probably find that it's very easy to get them to kind of separate. Um, but as soon as they get far enough away, then the, the opposite pulsing will then draw them together again. So on average, uh, the positron electron C will be just basically a neutralized C of, uh, of particles. But it's definitely not circular. That mechanism can totally work. It's a conservation of particles in, in my theory that I don't have to invoke anything different that the medium can be made out of the individual particles that make up the media. Because the media, when they're together, the, those two particles have such different properties that they can serve as the general medium. So I don't know if I Frank, managed to teach you there, but Frank, Franklin, you can never solve solve this if you don't try to understand what a continuum is. A continuum is uh, definitely different from a set of discrete objects. Well, I'm saying that there is no continuum. This was the argument that between the positrons and electrons, I claim nothing. There's no continuum. There's no field. Literally nothing. Yes, but these small things that you're talking about, they have they have no arms to to uh, catch or hold each other. They are not attached. Well, that's there must the, be a, there that's must the, be something in between them that holds them together. But no, they have nothing. They have nothing to hold them together. The only thing that can happen between two particles are collisions, right? That's the only thing in empty space that can have one particle can hit the other particle, another particle can hit the other particle in Newtonian collisions. Now, the, the other thing is that when you have something that looks like attraction, you know, between the positron and electron, it actually is no attraction. What has happening is that there is just a pressure on the outside. So the pressure on the outside, these two particles push them together. It's like you have two billiard balls and you hit them on opposite sides and they come together due to those collisions. Now, you wouldn't necessarily call that an attraction, but it looks like an attraction, two balls coming together. But it's actually because two balls on the outside hit. Well, Franklin, I just want to go back to what, how does a magnetic field, what, I mean, tell me what a magnetic field is and tell me what an electric field is. You haven't really told me that. You've told me how, you told me a lot of things that don't really tell me what those things are. I thought the electric field is just the, the electromagnetic wave coming off the electron as it resonates mm -hmm. at its okay, resonance. Now, so now you've just you've said the electric field is the electromagnetic wave. So you've used something that you haven't defined uh, to explain I something. The electromagnetic wave, to, wave, to no, I define the electromagnetic wave as the compression of the ether. So this thing's going out; it's pushing out. Yeah, but Wait a minute, hold on. But from I, your point of view, the electric field is is created the same way the magnetic field is, which is this oscillation back and forth of the... No, magnetic field is very different. Okay. So, um, keep that right, well, this is the electric field. All it is is just a wave coming off pulsing electron. That's it. That is electric field. Drops off one over R squared. That's the electric field. Now, what, what is the magnetic field? Okay, well, we have these positron electron dipoles that are just floating around. They can float around randomly. They can be pointing in any direction. But well, what I postulate is that if you have an electron that is flying through space like this, going through one direction, as it flies by those positron, like the positron electron dipoles will align as this electron is going by. So as you so you have all these electrons going by, it's causing all of these, these, these dipoles to align in one direction. It's kind of like 
with wind blowing through a field of flags, they all point in one direction. Now, once you have these, these dipoles all pointed in the same direction, that is the magnetic field. That's what I claim the magnetic field is. It's just a polarization of this dipole C. Because once you have these dipoles arranged, they're like plus, minus, plus, minus. If you take an electron, you try and shove it up perpendicular between there, it's like if this is a if this is an electron and this is a, 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 a the positive end of the of the uh, dipole, then it's going to want to be attracted because on the opposite side it could be an electron, on this side it's positive, so it's going to want to deflect. So any electron heading through this polarized let's see, is going to deflect in one direction, and will only deflect only if it cuts through the uh, dipoles. The, the spaces between the dipoles. And this is why there is no force, no magnetic force, unless the electron is moving. So do you understand that, Harry? So the the the, the, it, the polarization of the of the positive electron C is the magnetic field. All right. Well, it seems to me that your definition of the magnetic field could be equally created as the definition of the electric field because no, 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 the electric no, 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 field no, no, would no. polarize the dipoles as well. So I don't see why these electric dipoles are polarized to create the magnetic field. Um, and it's not the electric field that polarizes the dipole. So uh, um, I mean, I'm completely confused. Well, um, the key I, I don't think that works, I'm sorry. Well, it, magnetic field only exists in the presence of moving charges. The real I mean, issue that you have to deal with, Franklin, is how is it that the magnetic field and the electric field are propagated together as the electromagnetic wave? And in your theory, it sounds to me like you wrong. propagate a magnetic field or propagate an electric field. I can't figure out. What no, that, that's just completely wrong. That that's the, that's how you solve that problem. Because it, it, if you think that the that light is just uh, like an ordinary compression wave, then you can see that this whole concept of light being uh, like either transverse or being a combination of electro uh, electric and magnetic fields is completely. I mean, this is just like, it's so wrong. I don't even know how to begin to explain how wrong that is. Okay, well, I see we're out of time. <laughs> oh yes, we are out of time. Actually a little bit over time. But I mean, it, it's an interesting discussion, Harry. All the questions you ask are, are spot on. You know, what, what, is the, what is the electromagnet? Well, what is the electric field? What's a bear? What's, what's around an electron that causes it to have its properties, and then what's what is a magnetic field, and uh, how how can it have that properties, and how are the two related? You know, I think it may be a more interesting question as to you know how is it that magnetic forces can induce say electric, uh, you know, uh, uh, movements of electrons in wires, and and then vice versa. You know, this is this is a very important. Uh, thing that we use in electric motors and uh, almost everything is based on that process of, of switching between uh, electric uh, electricity and magnetic fields. But uh, perhaps we can get into that uh, next time and we'll maybe discuss the magnetic field a little bit more. But you know, just come up with questions like that and uh, we can discuss them. I think that's probably one of the most interesting things to talk about. But uh, we are out of time here with today's discussion. I will summarize a bit. So today we had David DeHilster and he explained about the upcoming conference uh, in July. So it's only a month and a half from now. So uh, if anyone's listening, it's, it's time to like, you know, buy your tickets. And he said like by uh, this month on the 17th, we do need to get a count on how many people are going to be using the, the, the hotel facilities there. So please think about that. And, uh, you know, I have to think about that myself and decide, you know, where I'm going to be staying and such. But I'll be there. So I'll be there. If you want to see me live, come to the conference. I'll be there.
Uh, and he also just explained about things that we can do to promote ourselves. David has come up with a YouTube channel. And uh, I'm not sure I want to create my own channel. I mean, I have my own YouTube channel, I guess, but it just has my name on it. <laughs> and it get literally dozens and dozens of views, so literally. But um, those are ideas that we can use. And make sure to like the uh, John Chappelle Natural Philosophy Society stuff on your Facebook. So uh, then uh, we, we can, you know, got back in our normal science chat. And we were discussing things about the history of the ether. And I did put up and put in the chat a link on a book that discusses uh, the previous attempts at the ether. And we had a discussion about if, about, you know, why is it none of those things really succeeded? So, and it, it may be because we just haven't found the right answer. And, and so for a thousand years, we have not been able to find the answer to what the ether is. Uh, we did, and then finally, you know, I, uh, uh, people were asking about uh, how, how this and that works. So now I do have my own pet theory about uh, what I think the ether is and how it, uh, how it uh, is a medium for the electromagnetic wave and what the uh, electric charge field actually is, which is actually still just an electromagnetic wave and what the uh what the magnetic field is which is a a polarized orientation of the of the positive electron field and so all of those varied concepts can be underwritten by this particular ether so but if you want to learn more about it we can talk about it next week but i believe that this is the uh, this is the end for this uh, week's discussion, and hope to see you next week. All right, thank you.